Welcome back. I want to talk to you in this next episode for uh, for Art History 209 about Egypt. What we're looking at here is a map of Egypt. And uh, the beginning of the Egyptian civilization is dated to what is called the unification of the two kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt. You'll notice that Upper Egypt is actually in the south. It's because it's in the highlands, and Lower Egypt is in the north at the Nile Delta. We call Upper Egypt Upper because it's in a more elevated territory, and Lower Egypt Lower because it's in a, a lower territory. The Nile is interesting, of course, because it flows from north to south. I think it's the only river in the world that is known to do so, but it's because it's flowing down from the mountains in southern Africa down to the uh, N uh, Nile Delta Valley in, uh, into the Mediterranean Sea. Egypt, Egypt uh, develops along the Nile Valley, as you could see in the map from the last section, uh, precisely for the same reasons as Mesop culture developed in Mesopotamia, because this is fertile territory. On either side of the Nile is a lot of inhospitable, desert-like land. But on either side of the Nile, in a kind of a narrow valley, uh, there is fertile um, ground to, to grow uh, crops and to uh, develop and establish a uh, civilization on, uh, which means that Egypt um, develops in kind of along the borders of the Nile. It doesn't really expand out beyond it very much. Uh, it's largely restricted to this area. Uh, the symbolism of the upper and lower kings uh, is, or, or the unification of e Egypt is symbolized in the crown of the Pharaoh War, which is a combination of the two crowns of the upper Egypt, remember in the south, and you can see this in this slide at the far upper left, uh, this kind of pointed crown um, versus the crown of lower Egypt, uh, and that in the unified uh, kingdom, uh, the two crowns are combined into one. Uh, the unification of Egypt is believed to be symbolized in this artifact, which is now called the Palette of Narmer. Uh, Narmer is seen in this uh, work at the in the register at the top, in the um, far left. He's the big figure wearing the crown of, uh, excuse me, of I have to get always get this straight of uh, upper, excuse me, the crown of lower Egypt. Uh, in, in the north. Um, on the other side of it, if we turn and look at the back briefly, we'll see that he's wearing the crown of Upper Egypt. It's here. He is the main character in the center. We'll come back to this in a second. Um, so it shows the unification. It's believed to show the unification of Egypt. Uh, here, Narmer is shown as a conqueror. Um, he's shown much bigger than everyone else in this image because, again, the Egypt, excuse me, the Egyptian artists are using this hieratic proportion, and they're using also a lot of symbolism or iconography to portray the importance of Narmer. Narmer is shown, again, he's the big guy at the upper left, he's shown towering above everyone else, his servants uh, and his standard bearers precede him in procession. At the far right of this upper register, we see a bunch of decapitated bodies. These are all of Narmer's enemies, all suggesting that you should not cross Narmer. Um, they're shown lying down, but they're shown in the same pictorial space as Narmer. So what we're seeing is, again, two different perspectives being shown in simultaneous viewpoints. If we look at Narmer and his attendants, we'll see that they are also shown in uh, this um, same from multiple points of view, again using what is called the composite pose. At the top, we see uh, two bulls' heads with uh, bulls that are combined with human heads, again reflecting some of these kind of anthropomorphic uh, or symbolic elements, uh, suggesting the the power and prestige of Narmer. A bull is an animal that you don't want to cross. At the very bottom of the palette, uh, we see an actual bull, uh, and it, 
and he's charging and breaking down the walls of a city. And again, we see multiple perspectives here. The bull is also trampling an enemy underfoot. But this kind of U-shaped uh, thing that we see at the, um, at the far right of the bottom, which are these little things that look like gears, are the walls of a city. And we're seeing the walls from the city of the city from the top, and we're seeing the bull from the side. So we're seeing two different perspectives being employed in the same pictorial space. This seems like it ought to be confusing. Why did the Egyptians do this? Again, for the same reasons that I mentioned uh, in the previous uh, talk, which is that they are trying to show as clearly as possible the content of the image uh, within this kind of um, within the, the limits of their pictorial representation. The um, idea is that by showing the image from multiple perspectives, we see a more complete view of what is happening. Just like we see Narmer's body from multiple perspectives, we see a more complete Narmer. By seeing the bull from one point of view and the city from another point of view, it more readily translates to us the symbolism, the concept, the idea that the bull is conquering uh, this city, and that furthermore, the bull ought to be identified with Narmer. If we have any confusion about the fact that this identification should be made, when we, when we look at the back of the palette, uh, we see that Narmer has a bull's tail um, coming out, uh, pinned to him, kind of like pin the tail on the donkey, but it's pinned the bull's tail on Narmer, again, identifying uh, um, his power and prestige as a conqueror. Narmer is shown here holding a club or like a scepter which he, and his one of his enemies by the forelock uh, and he's, he's about to club him it seems he's or he's raising his hand in triumph one or both. On the uh, perhaps what's being shown here is actually the killing of a sacrificial victim. This little fellow uh, behind Narmer's right arm uh, is his servant and he's shown holding Narmer's shoes, which suggests that Narmer is standing on sacred ground. You might remember the story again of, of Moses from the Bible where he approaches the burning bush and God speaks to him out of the burning bush and says, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Narmer is here on holy ground, and so he removes his shoes. The uh, god uh, Horus is shown here in the upper right of the palette. Um, He's shown standing on a group of papyrus plants, which is a kind of like cattail-like plant that proliferates along in the that proliferates in the Nile Delta. The Egyptians used this to make a kind of paper called papyrus, which they uh, left us a number of written documents on. But it's also a symbol of Lower Egypt and its mar the marshy territory uh, which um, it occupied. Here, Horus is shown holding a hook in the nose of a man um, who is attached to this group of papyri, of papyrus plants, which suggests that Narmer has conquered uh, Lower Egypt. Uh, he's dominated him. In the Bible, again, uh, there's a story about the Assyrians who would put hooks in the noses of their enemies and lead them along, just the same way uh, we lead bulls along by hooks in their noses because once you have someone by the nose you have them by a very sensitive part of their body and you can dominate and um, control them much more easily. If we compare the stele of uh, Nar the palette of Narmer, excuse me, with the stele of Naram Sin, we can see a lot of uh, similarities. Both Narmer on the left and Naram Sin on the right both are shown from this composite point of view. We see their chests from the front and their limbs from the s and head from in profile. Uh, both are shown with uh, uh, symbolic references to bulls, symbolizing their um, their power and prestige, their ability to um, conquer and control their enemies, um, and both of them use hieratic proportion again to emphasize the importance, the relative importance of Narmer and Naram Sin over everybody else in the, in the composition. The Mesopotamian peoples thought that their 
their rulers like Naram Sin were were divinely appointed, and in the um, in the Mesopotamian cultures, the the king or the ruler was also also often a priest. Uh, so he would be the arbiter of all the religious rites, uh, R I T E S, uh, as well as uh, political power. Um, in the Egyptian culture, they took this a step f further and began to identify the pharaoh or the ruler as being also a divine um, being in his own right. He was he was the son of God on earth, um, and thus to be treated. Uh, with the utmost respect. The belief in the divinity of the pharaoh also is the driving force behind most other Egyptian um, cultural practices, especially the building of the, the pyramids. Um, these early, uh, the earliest um, structures that the Egyptians built, permanent structures, were tombs for the pharaohs. Here we're looking at one of the very early tombs called a mastaba, which is kind of a slope-sided um, slab structure. And you can see that the part that's above ground here contains a chapel and an offering table where worshipers could come and leave a gift um, for the deceased, um, who's behind this wall. We see uh, the um, what's called a surdab, um, this little space behind the offering table with a, um, a statue that is represents the Ka or the spirit of the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh himself would actually be buried below ground down this shaft uh, in um, sealed off in uh, underground burial chamber burial chambers. On the offering table they would come and bring food or other gifts to the to the pharaoh that although the pharaoh can't physically eat them, at least his ka or his spirit could uh, feed off the spirit of these gifts. This was important because, because by maintaining the spirit of the pharaoh, by keeping it alive in the afterlife, the pharaoh could continue to um, bless and sustain his people from beyond the grave. So the Egyptians believed in the um, in the uh, Excuse me. What am I looking for? The words here. They believed in the um, the afterlife and in the uh, the eternal life of the soul. In the old kingdom, the earliest period of Egyptian civilization, they believed uh, in this for the pharaoh, but not necessarily for everyone else. In uh, the later, as Egyptian civilization developed, we see a, a kind of a democratization of this concept that not only the pharaoh, but anybody, um, everybody has an eternal soul. And that furthermore, anybody who can afford to uh, can and should um, have themselves mummified and buried in the proper way so as to ensure the happiness of their soul in the afterlife. The, the Egyptians don't have the same notion of the afterlife that we might have of uh, being sustained by God, but rather that the in heaven, but that the afterlife is really an extension of life here on earth. It's more of the same that goes on in eternity. The need for these um, these permanent burial structures is the motivation for much of Egyptian architecture. It gives rise to the to the pyramid. Um, what's interesting about this building is that this is the first pyramid that we know of, and we also know the architect's name. It's uh, Imhotep, and it was built for the um, king Djoser. Uh, again, uh, the name of the architect is Imhotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. And you can see that it looks a lot kind of like a ziggurat in that it has these different kinds of levels or structures, but really it's based on the mastaba. You can see here in this diagram that this uh, the step pyramid of Djoser um, was built on a mastaba and they expanded it, and then they built a series of stacked mastabas on top of it, but we still have the same burial shaft and chamber um, beneath the um, pharaoh here. Here is another diagram of the larger, more elaborate um, structure the, with a temple and uh, 
uh, festival complex and wall which enclosed this entire structure, so it became quite elaborate. Uh, the development of the pyramids develops out of this, uh, the mastaba or the burial chamber for the pharaoh. What's important here is that although pyramids look a lot like uh, ziggurats in that they both have this kind of what we call pyramidal shape, excuse me, I was taking a little drink of water, uh, even though the, the mastabas look like um, these, uh, even though, excuse me, even though pyramids look like ziggurats, they're not quite the same thing. So, in other words, the, the ziggurats are built as temples that are, are on the top of these man-made mountains. And we see the same kind of idea in Mesoamerica, too. The pyramids, though, are not strictly temples, but they're first and foremost burial chambers for the pharaohs. As they develop this idea, they eliminate the steps in the pyramid. These are the great pyramids at Giza, the largest ones that were made. And they're smooth-sided. They, they've been given a kind of geometric clarity, which is significant because the Egyptians are believed to have uh, invented and developed initially the study of um, geometry. But if we look at, again, these in diagram, we can see that uh, these, um, these pyramids are first and foremost burial chambers. We can see here that there's still a burial chamber below ground in the bottom, um, as well as a series of internal structures. They're mostly solid, but there's a series of internal structures uh, that allowed them to um, create air shafts and burial chambers and, and various kinds of escape escape uh, corridors and um, uh, false um, chambers in order to trick people into who might want to come and rob the tomb because the pharaohs were buried with all kinds of luxurious and uh, uh, earthly goods, gold, items, um, especially uh, precious stones, gems, um, all of which could lend them to being robbed. Uh, this is the Great Pyramid of Khufu, uh, one of the pyramids. Uh, here, uh, one of the pharaohs. Here we're looking at the. Here we're looking at the statue of Khafre, uh, the occupant of the greatest, um, the largest of the three pyramids from Giza. Uh, this is his Ka statue. It's carved out of diorite. It's carved out of diorite, which is a very hard. Uh, volcanic stone, which also was interesting because when it's when sunlight shines on it, although it seems pretty dark and somewhat um, maybe less than uh, interesting to us now, but when sunlight shines on it, it begins to glow a blue color that is very similar to lapis lazuli. The Egyptians, just like the uh, Near Eastern civilizations and people after them, all highly valued the um, stone, the blue stone lapis lazuli. What we don't, what we see here is not an example of the composite pose, uh, but, uh, but a similar kind of conceptual approach. The uh, coffre is shown in a very kind of rigid posture, which is meant to indicate his, um, his, his persistence in the afterlife. This is not a dynamic uh, body posture because he's meant to be being shown in a kind of eternal uh, position. Um, what I mean to say is that his posture suggests a kind of stability and serenity which is appropriate to um, uh, the afterlife. He's not shown moving but in a very static and stable sort of way. The way the uh, sculptor has envisioned this though is in a series of profiles. We can very clearly imagine, especially when we look at the base of the sculpture, the rectangular block from which uh, Khafre was carved from. We see a clear uh, kind of prismatic or cubic um, structure with a front, a side, and a back uh, and a top, um, which suggest similarly the kind of 
composite pose. It's not the composite pose that we see in two-dimensional representations, but it's similar. The same kind of stiffness and uh, rigidity that we see in Khafre can also be seen in another of these pharaohs who's buried at Giza, Menkare, who's shown with his wife, uh, who acts as his support and guide in the afterlife. Uh, both of them are also shown in a very traditional uh, uh, way, which is similar to the composite pose. They both are taking a step forward. Menkare's step is, is more uh, dramatic than his wife's step. But they both have their, uh, Menkare has his arms at his side um, in the similar way that we see to some of these other uh, two-dimensional poses. Uh, their heads are straightforward. Uh, we can clearly imagine them as if they are um, also, uh, uh, we, we can see their whole persons, except here they're being rendered in the round. You can see also that they, the a carver has not eliminated all the stone from the block. He's left this area in the center. That was necessary in order to um, in order to preserve the integrity of the statue. This is such a heavy um, uh, stone that um, it needs this um, center piece left filled in in order to allow it to stand up straight. The Egyptians used a uh, uh, what is called a canon, C-A-N-O-N, -N, uh, a canon of proportions, which canon is a word that means rule um, or law. There's a, a series of, of rules governing the representation of figures, uh, especially more important figures. The more important you were, the more important it was that you, uh, your representation conformed to this rule. What we can see here is that we see here an unfinished sculpture where the artist had gridded off a section and drawn in the figures, planning to carve away uh, this stone in order to, uh, to finish the sculpture, but he didn't get that far. We see here the figure shown in the composite pose. They have their arms to their side, not unlike Menkare, um, and the women on the right also conform to this uh, same kind of proportion. All the figures are the same height, uh, and this this determined the rules by which the figure was represented. This seems very abstract and quote-unquote not realistic to us. It's not because the Egyptians were unaware of realistic portrayals, but because it was important to clearly communicate uh, certain concepts or ideas about who these people were. The less important you were, the more likely uh, that you could be portrayed in a um, uh, in a more naturalistic way. Here we see a a scribe who is less important than the pharaoh or or a divine uh, god or goddess, um, and he's shown uh, in a with a much more what we might call a realistic or naturalistic way. His his body is shown soft and fleshy, um, as if he doesn't exercise regularly because that's. He doesn't. He's a scribe. He's, he's a scholar. He spends his day reading and writing. Uh, and he's shown with a papyrus scroll and a now missing pen in his hands, um, ready to take dictation from the pharaoh. Even uh, the lower you ranked in society, the more likely you were to be shown naturalistically. Here's a butcher uh, butchering a, um, a calf. Um, and he's shown in even more naturalistic pose, uh, not following the canon of proportions. If we think about this, this is a, let me approach this from a slightly different angle. Here we see uh, the pharaoh T participating in a, a, a hippopotamus hunt. We see T again in hieratic proportion, towering over his servants. T is shown according to the canon of proportion with his very kind of stiff and rigid kilt. Uh, uh, sticking out in front of him. Uh, his limbs are shown in profile, his head is shown in profile, his torso is shown um, full um, on. What this suggests is that t while his servants are shown in much more dynamic poses, not necessarily according uh, with the same kind of fixation on the canon of proportions, um, and they're shown in much more active postures other, uh, than T. The idea is that T as the pharaoh, as the ruler, stands above uh, the 
fray of human activity because he's like God. God is not in time. He exists outside of and above time, and he's not constrained by it. The Pharaoh the same way. The Pharaoh is a God. In a way, he exists above the fray of, of mortality and mortal life. It's important to show him in that way by showing him from multiple perspectives simultaneously. We see his whole self. He's not bound by space and time in the same way that uh, you and I are. The uh, hippopotamuses are shown in a kind of similar conceptual approach, actually. They're shown, the hippopotamuses themselves, which you can see at the very bottom beneath these little boats, um, as well as some fish, are shown uh, as if they are seen from profile. But the water in which they live, the river, is shown from the top down. This is the way the Egyptians had to express these kinds of conceptual ideas. We'll come back to this again um, in a future conversation as well. I want to look uh, 